Next up, we have Josh Cincinnati from Block Cipher, and he's going to be talking about the recent attack on uh, Bitcoin blockchain and entitled Bitcoin Shrugs Off Massive Attack. Uh, first off, thank you. Um, so first, let me just say thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Thanks to the Ledger guys for the presentation as well. Um, so I'm here uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, spam attack that happened in, in mid-July. And it's particularly topical because right now we're undergoing a little minor spam attack, it seems. If you check your mempools recently, it's around 10,000 transactions or so. So uh, hopefully, to those of you not familiar with what happened, this will give you a little bit of background and uh, so you can get more up to speed. Um, so before diving into that, uh, one small piece of corporate self-promotion and then I'll get on to the actual educational stuff. Uh, so uh, as, as Paige mentioned, my name is Josh Cincinnati, I'm a Bitcoin obsessed developer advocate. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff in, in tech, I co-founded an Android app startup, did product management and business development with the Washington Post, and uh, studied math and politics in college, so it's no wonder that I wrote a Bitcoin. Um, but, um, you know, for me, I, I've been sort of daydreaming about working at a Bitcoin startup, and, and the fact that I'm here doing this is it's really cool to be part of Bitcoin's uh, unfinished symphony. So I'm pretty stoked to be here and to be presenting in front of all y'all. Um, and then on the Black Cypher side of things, uh, it's also pretty appropriate that I'm doing this presentation here with the AWS logo right in front of me, uh, because we are effectively an AWS uh, for blockchain infrastructure. Uh, so if you're building a Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin app, uh, we provide the infrastructure, you go with whatever your idea is. Um, we have probably the best SLA in the business. Uh, you can talk, I think there are a few of our customers are in the audience here. Um, so uh, ask anyone, uh, we build dependable, great infrastructure, uh, and you don't have to focus on it at all. So, um, so if anyone's interested in building any Bitcoin applications, come see me afterwards. And I promise that's the last bit of corporate chilling I will do. So, what does AWS stand for? Amazon Web Services. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so, um, mid-July's massive attack. Unfortunately, Bitcoin did not sustain a performance by famed British trip-hop artist, Massive Attack. Um, I wish they had, it would be a lot better. Uh, although we did encounter a few teardrops, and if you get that joke, come with me to see a Massive Attack concert. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, no, in reality, uh, what happened in mid-July was, in fact, the uh, work of a sophisticated uh, well, relatively well-funded black hat uh, who is trying to either raise fees or disrupt the Bitcoin network. Um, and to kind of dispel some preconceptions because uh, some of the feedback that we received and, and heard before is that the, um, the spam attack in July was just a continuation of a stress test, in quotes, from uh, a particular organization, I, I believe it was coinwallet.eu that may have claimed responsibility for those June stress tests. Um, and, and truthfully, uh, they haven't claimed responsibility for it. And more than that, even if you were in the Bitcoin infrastructure space, seeing what was going on, you could tell that what was happening in June was demonstrably different from what happened in uh, early July. So uh, June's attack was, or, or should I say stress test, was consistent, there were small transactions, relatively small volume, um, and the transactions themselves were you know, really very similar. July spam attack was much more sophisticated. There was a great deal of uh, variability in the transactions that were uh, actually uh, propagated through the network, and the sheer magnitude was much, much greater. So uh, this is the only TPS report I care about, which is transactions per second in the Bitcoin network. Um, this right here is, is the blip that was part of the June stress test. And then a little bit further back here, there was also June 22nd, I believe, a tiny blip. July 6th, uh, not a few days after the fun BIP66 soft fork, was this massive TPS spike, got up to 200 TPS at one point, um, actually even higher than that, supposedly. Uh, and, and that was what differentiates this uh, spam attack, which really was an attack, uh, compared to the stress test in June. 
Um, so uh, how many of you are familiar with sort of the limitations of Bitcoin's transactions per second? Show of hands. Okay, that's enough that I can still sort of explain this, I think. Um, so to those of you who are unfamiliar, um, the real transactions per second limit comes from the fact that uh, there's a limitation on block size and block discovery time. So on average, a block is discovered every 10 minutes or so. Um, and that's sort of a semi, it's a random process, it's a Poisson process, but it's effectively every 10 minutes, a new block is discovered, and each block can only have a megabyte in it. And until recently, many miners had defaulted to the only 750 kilobytes. Um, so uh, these are all averages. The average transaction size is about 250 bytes. It can vary. But ultimately, if you just do the math on a million divided by 250, you get 4,000 transactions being discovered per block. And then that 4,000 transactions divided by 600 seconds is relatively 6.6 .6 transactions per second, which is pretty much the hard limit. In fact, it might even be a little bit lower based off real network conditions. Um, so that's, that's where when, everyone, when you hear people talking about like the four to seven TPS limit on Bitcoin, that's where it's derived from. That's what, uh, how many you know, blocks you're actually discovering on average in aggregate. Um, so uh, what winds up happening when you get higher than that number of TPS is uh, the mempool, uh, and it really should be called the many mempools because everyone has their own version of the mempool, balloons, it goes up. Um, and you can think of the mempool as kind of like a, a staging area or a mezzanine for transactions. So uh, you can effectively um, think of it as a place where people store all the transactions that haven't been put into blocks, nodes, and miners, both storing them there. And when TPS goes up, um, the mempool just goes nuts and goes up significantly. This is at the very beginning of the attack. This is the number of transactions in mempool. And you can see around, I think, 8, 8, 8 a.m. UT, UTC, boom, the number of, uh, of, of transactions in mempool just jumps up. Um, and these graphs, are, by the way, are all provided by statoshi.info. So if anyone wants to play with them yourselves, it's a fantastic site. Um, so uh, this, is, this is bad, uh, right? Because you have all of these transactions. Some of them are sort of malevolent, and some of them aren't. And you have to figure out, like, well, well as a miner, you don't care which ones are spam or not. You care about the ones that have the highest fees, right? Um, and so what the attacker did is, and, and if you get this idiom, um, they dropped the kids off of the mempool. So they literally were just grabbing up the mempool. Um, and, and a lot of mempools couldn't take it, like poor Martin over here. Um, so you wound up in a situation where many, many nodes uh, operating in low memory environments were crashing. Uh, mempools were becoming sort of disparate. And because of the lack of a concrete mempool policy, uh, you know, it, it created a lot of chaos, especially, especially for people that were just using these, so just at the beginning of the spam track attack trying to send transactions. They had no idea that there was going to be some massive amount of spam clogging the system. And effectively, many of them didn't have tra transaction confirmations. That is to say, none of their transactions got included in blocks for many days, or in some cases, they were dropped entirely. Um, so this is sort of what happened. You can imagine like each of these cars is a transaction. And because the spammer decided to just flood the network with all these transactions, uh, it created a kind of transaction a traffic jam. Um, so another way to look at it is uh, previously, before the spam attack, blocks were around half full or so. Um, so, and that's on average. Like you'd see some full blocks, but generally speaking, most blocks were only up to 400 or 500 kilobytes. And so uh, you could have as much, you know, you could, you could spend, there's a minimum fee, but generally speaking, you, most transactions would be included and you'd be fine. Uh, during the spam attack, it became like real estate around here, uh, which is to say crazy expensive. Um, so the minimum transaction fee went up 25 times, the average fee went up about three times. Um, and it, you know, once people adapted, it was fine, right? Like we all understood that, well, the average transaction fee was going up, and in order to get into the block, you had to be part of the 4,000 or so transactions above the 100,000 or so that may or may not be in the mempool that would you know, be accepted. Um, so um, the silver lining 
is that um, Bitcoin is robust and survived, uh, and actually, relatively speaking, uh, survived the plum. So uh, under 200 transactions, or you know, despite the fact that we reached 200 transactions per second, the network continued to operate, and, and after people adapted with fees, um, you know, we, we all, we all turned out to be okay, so that's great. Um, so there's a certain amount of like built-in protection um, that the network has, and, and credit, credit where credit is due to the Bitcoin core developers for creating such a robust protocol. Um, but there's, there's still some problems. So this particular attack was extremely cheap, like way too cheap, like not even, you know, it's, it's, it's just really someone who's disgruntled and, and instead of going to Vegas wants to spend five grand a day to screw with the Bitcoin network, they could do so. Um, and that's effectively what happened. If you actually looked at like the average of block sizes being about, you know, blocks being about half full, the other 500 kilobytes needed to be filled with these spam transactions. And so it cost the attacker about 16 Bitcoin or $5,000 a day. So that's, that's bad news. The, the good news is that, as I said before, there's a built-in protection. And effectively, as the attacker keeps attacking, they make it more expensive for themselves. They automatically rise the fees on all transactions. And then they themselves have to pay more in order to keep the attack going. So that's, that's sort of good. Um, but the problem from that is that it creates a new normal and higher fees. So y'all might not mind if you have to pay 15 cents for a Bitcoin fee or five cents for a Bitcoin fee, a fee excuse me. Um, but if you're talking about the oft, you know, repeated use case of Bitcoin in the developing world, Bitcoin where people don't have access to banking infrastructure, that cuts into the margins in a huge, huge way, um, into their margins. And, and people were, were where, where that fee matters the most is not with us, but with other folks that we desperately want to use Bitcoin because those are the ones uh, that benefit most from it. So that's, that's sort of a problem too. Um, and problem number three, which I alluded to, uh, large mempools are horrible. They're absolutely horrible. Um, the, the big problem with them is that there's no consistent mempool policy or rules, and it creates uncertainty and disarray when people are wondering whether their transactions are ever going to be confirmed. Um, and there are ways to mitigate this, but ultimately, like, it's really bad news if you sent a transaction right before the uh, spam attack started. Uh, effectively, you, you have Bitcoins that can't be spent without basically attempting to double spend them or respend and double spend yourself. Um, so that's bad. Uh, but the golden lining is um, that th these are all solvable. Um, like, we can, we can figure this out. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, we, can, we can all solve these. Um, so there's not going to be like some angel coming down from far above to fix this for everybody. Like this is really up to us to fix as a community. You know, Satoshi isn't around anymore. Um, so so we have to figure out how to do it ourselves. Um, but it's it's all possible. You know, um, we I think that there's um, in in the Bitcoin community there's there is a sense of this sort of uh, inertia in terms of. Uh, we, we want to, you know, we want to keep things as they are because they work, but we're we're a little worried about actually building, you know, new things and, and iterating. And um, I think that's part of the nature of a, a consensus-driven protocol. Um, but there's a lot that we can do to fix these. And already, even in, in Bitcoin Core 11, there's the min relay fee that was added, and there are uh, also um, you can create like customized limits for the amount of free transactions that you'll accept. Um, so there, there are certain mitigation tools, and I know that the core developers are hard at work at figuring out other methods. Um, but I know that these things are solvable. As, and to, to maybe harp on another point that might be a little sensitive, um, it, it is interesting to note that this attack would be significantly more expensive if the block size was a little bigger. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily harp on that point, but you know, um, it's just something to consider. Um, but yeah, uh, so for more details about sort of the spam attack and our perspective as a Bitcoin infrastructure company, um, feel free to check out uh, the Block Cipher blog, which I really want to rename to Blog Cipher, and maybe that'll happen one day. Um, or uh, next week, I'm going to be presenting again, but more focused on some of the things that uh, Block Cipher had to overcome from a technical perspective. So if you love technical postmortems, uh, swim by next week for the SF uh, Bitcoin Dev Meetup. Um, but yeah, that's that's all. Thank you all very much. Um, if there are any questions, by all means, open to them.
if you were in control, where would you put it? Oh. oh, yeah, so he was asking if I was in control, where would I, uh, where would I put sort of the block size, or the, the block size debate? Um, I actually, uh, so first off, I'm an awful person to give control to, so I wouldn't give me any control. This is why I believe in decentralized things. Um, but, um, you know, ultimately, I, I, I think that uh, there's, and this is me speaking personally, not for the company, just, just my personal view. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that like Moore's Law is, con is continuing to grow and, and, and iterate, and we're figuring out, uh, as we blaze past storage problems and, and um, you know, CPU, CPU issues that we thought we'd never solve, it seems to continue unabated. And ultimately, like Bitcoin originally didn't have any, um, you know, any block size limit in the beginning. It was merely uh, put in there as a hack to prevent spam attacks, which it, it did, but you know, also created this opportunity for a fee-based spam attack to appear. So I, I'm a big believer in, I think, Gavin's proposal for doubling. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Uh, that said, you know that's personal opinion, and I understand that that could lead to some contentious debate. So, um, yeah, but a good question. Yeah. I'll save you from answering any further block size questions. <laughs> what do you think the underlying motivations are for? What's your opinion on what the underlying motivations are for somebody doing this? Sure. Uh, out there? Yeah, yeah. So, I've, you know, I've heard a couple of theories. I'm not sure. You know, there's I guess there's a theory that it was it was part of some system to increase mining revenue, which certainly did increase mining revenue for some folks. Um, I, I I think it was it may have been a call to action to get folks to realize that they weren't really uh, adapting to potential future circumstances. Because in some sense, you know, we wound up hardening our infrastructure as a result of the spam attack. And it was stuff that we probably wouldn't have done otherwise. And it, and it actually, uh, to, to the credit of someone on Reddit, like I said, well, you know, um, it's stress tests like this that, that are necessary because they help people uh, evolve their infrastructure in ways that they wouldn't have been tested with in production. Generally, I don't like testing stuff like this in production, but this is a decentralized network and you can't really control that. Um, so in some sense, like, you know, we had a fee estimation feature that no one had heard about, and we ended up highlighting it, we started using it in our own microtransaction API. So there's, I think there's reason to believe that maybe it wasn't entirely malevolent. Um, that said, you know, fair warning would have been nice, and I think that, uh, you know, that in the future, whoever is doing this stuff, if they could go ahead and, and announce it, that'd be wonderful. Um, yeah, sorry, I saw a question over there. Oh, oh, no, from you, yeah, uh, yeah. Me? yeah, 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 um, Kalai, Kalai, you know, like when you're talking about Spam Nation. Oh, who's that? Who's Spam Nation, are you familiar with Spam Nation? Mm -hmm. No, no. Okay, well, then, I guess I have no question. I'm oh, sorry. okay, no worries. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so I wonder, you, you mentioned in this talk, or I guess you the, the title of the slide, mm -hmm. and I saw you Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's absolutely true that like some of the wallets that either haven't been around for very long or haven't really been uh, putting in serious efforts to make sure that they're robust against you know things that people have been talking about are going to happen at Bitcoin for a long time mm -hmm. uh, were affected in the early you know uh, were affected by this because they had to like add the estimation window. Sure. But I'm not sure why you're claiming that like bad mempools are inherent, or big mempools are inherently bad, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we can limit mempool size pretty easily, like there's been patches floating around to limit mempool size forever, uh, but mempools will not be zero consistently. That's not something that anyone expected to be around for no, no, that, that, that's right, although I guess, I guess I should clarify it and said that large mempools relative to block size is bad. I mean, just generally. Well, I mean, yeah. Are you referring to like it's bad because it causes Bitcoin to need to use more memory, or what is it about it that's necessarily bad? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think part of so part of what I was getting at is is that when you have and and to your point, like some of this stuff was ended up getting tested and people had to adjust as a result of it. But there are many implementations and people you know who, who are operating Bitcoin nodes and very low memory environments that wound up. Uh, crashing and then their mempools were cleared, right? 
um, and then they you know started back up, and and effectively you had not necessarily consistent gaps in the network, but there became a certain degree of inconsistency on what people would see uh, within a mempool. There wasn't like a uniform. But, there's no, but what is the advantage to having like a unified mempool, right? That doesn't necessarily buy you anything aside from like people can see what is in their mempool. I, I, yeah, so I, I agree with all, that. Almost all wallets will rebroadcast transactions that haven't occurred, right? So like if mempools mm -hmm. crash and they lose your transaction, you'll rebroadcast it. Uh, sure, but if other uh, so if you rebroadcast a transaction and other places have already seen it, then you're you're kind of uh, well. In a sense, what you wind up doing is is stressing out individual parts of the network, and and I um, I think that part of the the rationale of why that is bad is that you wind up having this inconsistent queue over the long haul. Like if you had a if you had a mempool that was two hundred thousand transactions and a one megabyte block and Generally speaking, like what we really want more than anything else is those transactions to exist in the blockchain because they're uh, they get hashed and secured, and, and you have the blockchain behind all of them, right? Like that's the ultimate goal. And and if you have so many different uh, implementations, uh, or rather, if you have a, a I think a, a wide variety of different implementations that have different mempool rules, and some of them might just start cutting off transactions or creating weird sort of real. Well, I don't know. So, so that's that's a question I think about, like assigning a particular value to some transactions over the other. And I don't know that I'm qualified, or any other individual mempool or miner is qualified to make that. Well, it's about the people you feel about it, right? Like, it's whether miners are getting affected. Sure. Yeah, but if, I mean, uh, well, I, we, we can take this offline at some point. But I, no, I, I do appreciate like that there are there are reasons to have a dynamic fee market, and I want miners to be incentivized to do that. But um, but yeah, we, we can talk about it later if you want. Thanks. Any other? Yeah. Um, in real time, what's the easiest, most clear way to tell that one of these attacks is going on, so that you know how to you know something might be going on with Bitcoin. Right. Exactly. So, so partially... Like a website or a new yeah, website. yeah. So there, there are a lot of websites that are basically just running nodes and you can see um, specific, like, part... Okay. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're not a big genius with all these fancy graphs and numbers, <laughs> what's the simplest way to just know, mm -hmm. in the simplest way, some, something that's really idiot proof? So actually, I don't really have an answer to that question. That's okay. You know, That's okay. I because there isn't like a, I don't think there's a clear cut way like spam attack underway. Your transactions need to have priority. Part of it is that a lot of a lot of wallets and our own API has a fee estimation feature. Um, so I'm going back to my promise not to show for my company. But but um, there is there are lots of wallets and, and even Bitcoin Core has its own fee estimation feature. And looking at like pat recent history it can show you what your fee should be in order to make it into the next block. But that doesn't really count for what's happening in real time. And I, I don't know if anyone has a better answer uh, for a place where you can... Uh, I have I have one. So, so you see the I have a better answer. We just don't know. We're just going to go with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I like to go with the flow. Right. Right. We're going to go with it. Back there. That's true, although you know you gotta be able to communicate, I think, to users that are just starting with Bitcoin that like, oh my, I thought the fees were only gonna be this much and you see this massive jump in fees, you know? So that's a that's a question I think for how you how you approach like the fee market thing from a user perspective. And I'm not sure because I agree with you, like I think it should be handled by the application, but then figuring out how to communicate that to a user in a way where they aren't like supremely surprised by it, uh, would would also be sort of useful I think to think about in the future, you know. What's that? Tell them it's 2%, they'll be delighted when it's large. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, 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 have, I, have, I have the best one. I have the best one. It's, 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 it's physical, like... 
That's true. Um, any other questions? Last question. Last question. Oh yeah. Well, you made a really good point that uh, early early adopters aren't going to know why a fee would be higher, and they might not even. I mean, they might not even know that their transaction didn't go through, and they got no banker to call and say, "Hey, I made a payment, half my product didn't show up, or how come the right. I didn't get the credit on my, you know, like so? How does that get solved?" Yeah, I mean, I. I'm not sure. Um, I I think that, that as a result of this spam attack, uh, a lot of people have wound up adjusting their software and have started like telling people that hey, you know these are these are estimates, right? And these are fee like our fee estimates are adaptive and they're based off of network conditions as they exist. Because ultimately, when you think about it, like you look at the mempool and all it's going to get in is whatever is the top megabyte of transactions, right? And you need to figure out a way, I don't know what the easiest way is to communicate that to users that have not spent years like right. focusing on Bitcoin. And, and that's a big usability challenge. And uh, yeah, so I, I actually, all you wallet guys out there, if you can figure out a solution. And, um, but, but I mean, I think that there are, there are a lot of solutions. So the questions are like, making it still competitive for the miners and also having opportunities for the spam attack to be less effective and keep fees more consistent would also be welcome. Yeah. So, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.